Well, it isn't my intention of depreciating science in this discussion, but I think in the century that lies ahead, science will have to fulfill a destiny that it does not fully understand or appreciate even now. I think, therefore, we should take a little look at the perspective of the thing. I think we can say that science was conceived in the 17th century, largely through the works of Francis Bacon, the Royal Society, and an occasional contribution by René Descartes. This was the very beginning. In the 18th century, it was born, born as the age of reason, and the tremendous emphasis upon the liberation and emancipation of enslaved peoples. It was a very important contribution to make. In the beginning of the 19th century, uh, we will say that science went through its childhood. It was growing up on all sides with new contributions to learning. And in the 20th century, now closing, science reached adolescence. It has not matured as yet. It is less adolescent in the sense that it is full of the dreams and fantasies that we find in the teen teenager getting ready to start out in life. We have to realize that there is certain responsibility that accompanies knowledge, and this is something that teenagers seldom recognize or realize. Many years ago, I was talking to a young physicist on the campus at Berkeley University of California, and I was asking him how the scientist was able to work comfortably on nuclear fission. Well, he said, it's very simple. We are scientists. We invent things. We have nothing to do with the way they are used and no responsibility for it. Now, this perhaps is a little more truthful than we like to realize. We are surrounded constantly with opportunities for change, but each one has a hazard. Now, science claims to be an exact discipline. It claims to be the most factual of all forms of knowledge and claims in this a certain superiority over all the arts and ethical cultures of mankind. But if it is really the custodian of higher learning and is the ultimate science by means of which the world should be regulated, then it must grow up itself and find out that growth is responsibility, that there is much more to science than inventing things. There is control of their use. It is absolutely necessary that there be protections upon the uses of knowledge. Now, this sounds very curious and complicated. Back in Egypt, they were faced with this problem, but in a slightly different way. In their day, knowledge was largely religious and philosophical. But they found then it could be exploited. And they had to place various limitations and restrictions upon the communication of knowledge. They had to bind those who received it to the deepest obligations of their nations and their faiths. Here we have made no responsibility out of knowledge. Knowledge is an infinite opportunity to do what you please to do more efficiently. This is not the end of learning. The end of learning is to know what we should do and do it well. This point has not yet been covered uh, by modern learning. We are still in the age where we are not counting and watching the results of what we do. The present century is coming to a close. In a few years, we will start a new era in the civilization of mankind. We now have an opportunity of examining and rationalizing nearly 90 years of the 20th century. Most of the work that has been done in higher physics, biology, has, have been, has been emphasized in this century. And we see what is happening. And what we see is of importance to science, because science should be watching for what other people and other beliefs do see, and make sure that they have covered successfully 
the various problems that are related to the expansions of knowledge. I think, therefore, we should go down and begin to think about these things. I remember what was supposed to be the first motion pictures. Whether they were first run or not, I won't guarantee, but they were well back. One was the great train robbery, which lasted about three minutes, and another was the eruption of Vesuvius, about the same length. That was the beginning of what we now call the motion picture industry. This industry would have been impossible without science. It would have been impossible to evolve and dramatize the techniques of communication without scientific skills, without research, and without all the factors that are involved. So we now trace for a moment only the descent of the motion picture industry until we come down to the time when we begin to see that it became an important financial factor. When it became basically possible to become wealthy as the result of films, the whole motivation changed. A little later, another very sad mistake was made. The Hayes office was discontinued. This was the only control that was possible to control the morality and ethics of films. Because that would interfere with profit, this particular impediment to progress was removed. Until today, after nearly a hundred years of exploration and invention, we have an industry which is practically morally bankrupt and physically very much in debt to itself and everything else we find that the film industry, instead of becoming the great blessing that it was supposed to be, and the very great help in communication, education, and knowledge that was hoped would be, has gradually deteriorated, deteriorated into a quick money-making service to the worst principles and policies of mankind. While this was also going on, other things were happening. Ford developed his flivver. It was a very basic motor car. It was about, a, you could buy it for about $50 down and pay maybe four or 500 complete payment. This was the beginning of the horseless carriage, the beginning of the liberation of animals. No more would we see these great beer trucks and the drivers beating the helpless horses. We were going to have a new era of communication and transportation. And now, after nearly a hundred years of this tremendous asset, we still have the motor car, but it's getting to be immovable. We can't go anywhere anymore. We have drowned ourselves in our own convenience. We have continued to sell them when the roads were not worthy, and today the congestion due to motor cars will be found in practically every country of the world, the only exception being those that have by social laws or by communistic controls, refuse the use of cars to the public. Therefore, we have a, car, a marvelous help that has ended in a stalemate, a mate in which the car becomes an enemy of its own motion. We have no real solution to this, but there is much talk about what we should be doing. But actually, we are in serious trouble. We don't know what to do with these inventions and these contrivances that we have developed. Now, with all of this, we finally have come through all kinds of developments until we reach, perhaps, uh, the most staggering of all, nuclear fission. Without uh, science, the atomic bomb would have been impossible. Without the developments of science, the progression of nuclear weapons would be impossible. And yet, at the moment, there seems to be no sense of responsibility. Why was it permitted that science would do this to us. It certainly wasn't necessary to the advancement of knowledge. It certainly wasn't advance necessary to the advancement of economics because this particular invention, discovery, practically guaranteed the collapse of civilization unless it could be controlled and controlled immediately. But it was not controlled and it is not controlled and has gone into the greatest financial cycle of exploitation imaginable and has bankrupt most of the nations of the world that have dared to participate in it and all the rest sit in fright of what it's going to do. Now this is something that should not have happened. There should have been some way in which the most learned, most skillful, best schooled, most educated, 
class of people in the world would, should have been able to administer progress without this happening. Something went very much amiss in this very highly prestigious feelings and department of human thought. We were supposed to be under the leadership of a rational, intelligent, progressive group of thinkers. What was the main trouble? Well, I think perhaps one of the main causes of difficulty was that the learned body failed to educate those who were going to be the customers. We did not prepare young people to live in a world of conveniences and commodities as we know them today. And as a result, we are ruining the young people, destroying their characters, and endangering the civilization to which we are a part. All this shows that something is wrong in the controls and directions of knowledge. We are not doing that which is necessary to make the thing practical and work. Perhaps the thing that was most necessary today in the world of higher learning is integrity. And with all our skills, we have no course on the subject. We do not enforce rules of ethics, morality, or integrity upon knowledge or upon any group of people in society. Each individual is entitled to do the best he can or the worst he can, and no one can be held responsible for it. We know these things are happening. We know the dangers of them. We know the dangers of alcohol and narcotics. We know what happens when drunk drivers drive a $25,000 car. But all this is passed over lightly. We get a few statistics occasionally, but no one seems to know why. The most intelligent generation we have ever known is in the worst trouble of any generation recorded in history. We have had more deaths, more wars, more plagues, more earthquakes, more social disturbances in the 20th century than in most of the previous world put together. We find the inhumanity to man is greater than it has ever been. What is the matter? How does it happen that we can become skillful without becoming better human beings? How does it happen that we can know more than our forefathers and live worse? These things have to be considered in terms of the 21st century. What are we going to take forward into that century? Are we going to take this form of scientific research, which might be called an entertainment form, into that century and continue the same way we are? If we do, we will probably be out of business before the end of the 21st century. Because nation after nation is arming in the nuclear weapons, Individual after individual is being trained to accept these things as inevitable facts, when in reality we should not accept them as facts at all. Now we have another dimension added to our joy, the computer. And the computer could become a great help to mankind, but it could end education because no one will need to read or write again. Also, if that happens, then our literature will be controlled by machines and we will not be able to read what we want to read. We'll read what is computerized to us, which will make it very easy not to read at all and thereby lose all concepts of the individual thoughtfulness, digestion of known knowledge, facts, or ideals. We are in this problem with computer, which is in danger of becoming the most deadly instrument we have ever known is apt to be worse than the nuclear bomb because it is going to gradually work in until it controls every aspect of civilization then comes the desperate moment when the where the computer controls everything who controls the computer this becomes a very important factor because even the breakdown now may be result in hours of delay and wait we know that all of these inventions and everything that we are doing and trying to do is stymied because of the lack of integrity of people. The inventor is lacking in integrity. The person who is profiting from the invention is lacking in, te in integrity. And the invention itself is a menace. These things put together constitute a threat to the next century a threat we have to face with more than ordinary thoughtfulness. 
So we have to begin now to see what we can do about some of these things. We are already unhappy over most forms of entertainment, but we simply relax and let it pass. Now nature, however, is a little more thoughtful on these matters than we are. We are in a universe that is governed by law, and this law demands the ultimate victory of integrity, and it will never stop hurting us and punishing us till we behave ourselves. This seems like a very doleful thought because we have become so disobedient that we can hardly imagine obedience to anything to be less than a penalty. But actually, we are in a universe of law and order. We are in a universe of cause and effect. We have seen, in history at least, the fall of nation after nation because it departed from the integrities of life. And we see today a new world the 20th century going into the 21st, in which the breaking of universal and personal codes of ethics, these things have become commonplace. Practically everyone is willing to compromise principle for profit. With this to lead us, we go into a new dimension of time which has not yet been spoiled, and it will be a pity indeed if we have to spoil it. And we will spoil it unless we take something in there more than a desire for more money or more power. With this continued lack of values, we are going to have the continued pressure of circumstances. Now, if science is really going to be a leader, its best place to start will be in the educational field. It should prepare every student that comes out of a university to use the discoveries that have been made mostly and almost entirely for the common good. We should be using what we know to help to build a better world and not merely to build a, be a bigger bank account for ourselves. We should be given talks in, in education in ethics. Now religion is scared to death of the thought of uh, being involved in politics, but it has to be. And politics are not particularly happy uh, to be mixed up in uh, religion. And science it doesn't like either one of them. <laughs> so everything is at a complete standstill. We will finally have to face the fact that survival on any level, from that of the savage to that of the saint, must arise from one thing only, integrity. According to the laws of its kind, According to the degree of its enlightenment, each thing that lives must keep the truth about itself. It must accept the reality of its purpose. Science has given us no purpose for life except physical luxury and physical power. In its refusal to allow emphasis upon religious principles, uh, science is damaging itself and the whole world. Every scientist should be a religious person because unless science is part of religion, there is a very terrible problem that we are not going to be able to solve. The mere fact that a man is a physicist does not justify him in being an atheist or an agnostic. I know one young man who was in the University of California who was a physicist, married and had two children. I asked him how he equated this problem with his personal convictions and the raising of his children. And he said very frankly, he said, well, five days a week I'm an agnostic and on Saturdays and Sundays I go to church and I'm a Christian. Now this is not very reasonable. It is utterly inconsistent. And uh, no new nations now that have come up in the last 50 years determined to destroy religion because it interferes with power play have suddenly been forced to return to it again because the structures they build will not hold together without it. And we can say the same thing of the 21st century. Unless spiritual values are emphasized and brought into physical and proper social applications, we are not going to get very far in the, 20, in the 21st century. We're going to be right back in the trouble we've been in all the time. I think we have to realize definitely that science is going to have to make peace with faith. Now this does not make a problem as big as we might think it was. 
many of the very great thinkers of the world, philosophers and early scientists, were God-loving people. You don't have to be an atheist in order to work a computer. You don't have to be an atheist in order not to want to go to war. You do not have to be a, an atheist in order to drive a car. But sometimes driving will make one out of you if you're not careful. <laughs> Actually, the more faith and integrity we can get into civilization in the next 10 or 11 years, the better off the future is going to be. <clears throat> we do not need theological uh, pressures at this time. We do not need to be warned of the possibility of the have hell, fire, and damnation, because we, if you really want that, we'll get it by doing just what we're doing now. And we'll have a possibly, probably a nuclear war one of our days, and that will be the nearest to purgatory that anyone will want to come. So we do not have to change all of our beliefs and our habits, but we need integrity. And how are we going to base integrity unless we base it upon something? We certainly can't base it on politics. We can't base it on science. We can't really base it on theology. But there has to be integrity. And the degree of integrity that we pass on to the next century will determine how that century is going to come out. Without integrity, it will never do more than this. Just dig us deeper into the sloughs of our despond. There is no way out except by growing up. Now, is it po not possible to take away from the world the knowledge that it possesses? Most countries of the world have at least the secret of the nuclear bomb, even if they're not making it, and more will continue to make it. There's no way of preventing this. There's no way of taking away the knowledge that exists. There is no way of legislating against this knowledge. It will simply go underground and continue. The only answer is to change the person who is using this knowledge to make the individual self-responsible and responsible for, to society for the misuse of power. And the average citizen, therefore, is the one whose code of responsibility will determine the use of knowledge. And until he chooses to express himself clearly on this subject, we will not have any rare, real ma or major recovery. Now, how shall we do this particular thing? I think we have to begin to estimate why things are as they are. Why has this century, the 20th, come into the mess that it's in? It is largely responsible uh, to the financial structure that we are in this mess. We have become a people, a world, to whom the almighty dollar is the most important thing on earth. And as far as that's concerned, if there's a heaven, it must be the most important thing there, or no one wants to go there. It is a definite case of where, by stupidity, uh, by cupidity, we have brought this misery upon the world. And it was going to continue as long as we permit it to. As long as we will condone bad television, we will have it. As long as we pay high prices for things that hurt us, the longer we will have them. The only possible way to correct the situation is for the person of basic values simply being permitted or taking the chance of, of applying them. We need what we might term basics. Now, the basics of knowledge are not necessarily to be found in uh, Oxford or Cambridge. The basics of knowledge are very simple. They're all in the Ten Commandments. They're all in the Golden Rule. Now, when you stand the golden rule up alongside of science, it looks very, very homely and incomplete. But without the golden rule, science will ultimately destroy itself and everything else. There has to be integrity. And we must have more integrity when we go into the next century, or we will be in even more trouble than we're in now. Because all the things that we are doing now are accumulating us and building into us more trouble. Consequently, we should begin to give lots of thought at this time to the integrity of the average person. We do not need religion in the public schools. I don't favor that particularly either. But I do know that religion and ethics are not identical. Ethics is an integrity. 
uh, may say that religion impels or implies this integrity. We may say that religion supports this integrity. But whether we are religious or not, we have to be honest or fail. There is no such a thing as a successful crook. Everyone has to have integrity. Now, for a long time, we have covered the whole thought of integrity with the concepts of religion. And while this has been a bone of contention with science for a hundred years, the fact remains that science must also find some kind of a way of making honesty the pivot upon which all knowledge moves. To do this, we have to accept integrity. We do not need to dramatize it as theology, but we have to recognize the sovereign importance of honesty. And honesty, if we can discover it, will be a greater discovery than anything science has ever known. The actual fact is that science must discover integrity or we're all in deep trouble. Now, how can science actually, basically, justify integrity? Science is supposed to deal only with very clear and definite facts. Well, let's accept that. Is there any more fact that is more clear or agreeable than World War I? Unless perhaps it be World War II. Is there any way of escaping the simple fact that these wars were not accidents bestowed by providence, but by the ambitions and uh, corruptions of individuals? In other words, science can prove definitely that wars are caused by selfishness, arrogance, stupidity, and many similar faults. This should be written into the scientific code. Science shouldn't say, well, we have to make better weapons so we can win the war. The answer is we must make better people and prevent the war. But no one is doing that. Everyone is looking for more markets in which to sell the goods. We should recognize, and science should recognize, by a study of this century alone, that every false move, every corruption that has arisen in society has been fatal. Everything that was wrong has hurt. Everything that has, is right has helped. It is perfectly possible to develop a scientific thesis on this subject and prove as basically as the law of gravity the principles of right and wrong. There is no escaping them. And they are scientific. And those who have lived through the miseries of them know this. But it seems so difficult to get people and, uh, with highly developed mentalities to accept a simple rule like the golden rule. It has to go through physics and the laboratory and be broken down into all kinds of calculations before it's considered. But by the time the calculations are all made, the patient is probably going to be dead. Therefore, the better point is to make the decisions now. There has never been a moment in history where corruption hasn't been the cause of pain and misery. And the, this should be just as scientific a fact as anything else. Now, in another way, we find that uh, much of science is unnecessary. It is much of it simply a kind of show. It's an entertainment. It is something to amaze people, but not to change the course of anything. A good example of this is the moon landing. This was an achievement that will echo down through the corridors of time. But what did it actually accomplish? We stayed for a few moments on a dead planet and came back home. All the rest is drama. All the rest is the adventure of space flights, all this type of thing. But all the time we were doing these things and spending billions of dollars to, doing, to the doing of them, we were sitting at home with common problems unsolved. We were still working, trying to find out what happened to the national debt. We were trying to find out why people don't have decent housing. We were find, trying to find out why taxes are rising above a reasonable point. But all the things such as the moon landing were very interesting. There's no question about that. They might be as interesting as Ringling Brothers Circus. Maybe a little more interesting. But we didn't have anything but Ringling Brothers Circus. 
but that we should spend great amounts on this and regard this type of thing as a scientific achievement is simply to lower the indignity of science, to my estimation. It is something in which we use some kind of a cosmetic or an anesthetic or something to conceal the weaknesses and the sorrows and the pain that is underneath. We are going to probably try to land a man on Mars one of these days, but even while we're doing it, we will probably find that the sewerage system of the earth is completely overloaded and no one is doing anything about it. We have problems here that must be solved, and without the solution of these problems, I think science is not worthy of the adulation that it has received. It must do something that is important and necessary in order to gain public respect. And this is becoming more obvious because many people are turning away from science because they are now considering it as the principal source of advanced armament. This is not the way it should be. Now we might say there is a market for that armament, and with this type of uh, sales, there'll be more laboratories, more physicists, more biologists, more chemists, and the scientific community will flourish. But if it flourishes over the body that are counted dead, there's something wrong with the entire concept of human knowledge. I think we must know that the purpose of knowledge is to prevent pain. It is not even a problem of be being to find a remedy. Remedies will be found by small knowledge, it, but the, the sickness itself will be discovered by a great knowledge. All these things are coming into focus for the next century. We're going to have to live there. Some of us won't live there, probably. Some of us will pass on to even to another century. But all these things have to be considered as we prepare for this great jump into the future. And we need essential correction in education. We need an education that receives the respect of the public in general because of the fact that it is obviously right, straight, and honest. We need to trust our leaders. We need to be led by persons of integrity. And they, in turn, must help those who have enough integrity to receive the help properly. Therefore comes a great system of reschooling. We must have something more than the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, as they used to be called. We need something else. We need another uh, kind of dimension. We need revelation. We need something that opens up the inner life of the person so that he understands what it means to be the citizen of a living universe. These things we have forgotten, or probably never known. And those ancients who uh, told us about them are carefully omitted from the quotation books. We don't want to be reminded that selfishness cannot live. We want to believe that it can, and we want to prove that it can by a few days or a few months or a few hours of personal selfishness, in which we will gloat and then all of a sudden the blow hits. Out of our misconduct comes most of the sickness that affects our bodies. Out of our wrong attitudes come the ailments that affect our mind. And out of these together come the ailments that affect nations, and finally lead whole peoples and races into political and military corruption. All these things are part of something that we should have learned in the 20th century. The 20th century was the ABC school of the sciences. It was in, that, in this century, now passing out, that we had the full flowering of the scientific concepts. We knew all about all these things. We learned a lot of useful things. We learned how to perform marvelous surgeries. We have saved many lives. We have lightened many burdens. But with it all, we haven't touched the source of things. We haven't touched the simple dignity of being right. We have not realized the importance, not only of finding how to do a complex surgical operation, but we should also have the responsibility of not charging for it at a rate that impoverishes the family for the rest of its existence. All these things depend upon integrities, and these integrities have got to be strengthened, and they will have to be strengthened on every level. Those most educated should be the first to be strengthened. 
but will probably be the last. The individual who doesn't know enough to make big mistakes will probably get along better than an individual with, no no with more knowledge but a perfect willingness to corrupt his own character. We see around us today an increasing interest in mysticism, in esoteric thoughts. We are becoming more aware of the importance of inner communion. We know that the solution of most things lies in ourselves and not in the laboratory. And that if we want to talk about laboratories, we can remember that Robert Plodd pointed out that the human digestive system is the most wonderful laboratory conceivable. He, the alchemists talked about changing base metals into gold. And man's personal digestive system changes foods into the elixir of life by which he lives. All these things, however, add up to a realization that nature is rich in values. There's much more in nature than the discovery of new products and byproducts. There is much more in nature than the continuation of the mistakes we are making now. In nature is also the key to remedies, because nature is very quick to reward right, but it is equally quick uh, to punish injustice. So as we go into the future, we need moral training. We need a new standard of ethics. We need a realization of some spiritual power, some principle that is beyond the ordinary reach of the, of the mortal mind. How science can go into the mysteries of matter, how the physicist can examine all the forces working in nature and not come to realize that there has to be some one universal principle guiding all of this. How can we deny that there is anything beyond what we know when it is obvious that the little that we know will not take care of us, let alone keep the universe in balance? Here we move among the stars. Here we move in a great galaxy. We move in forces and powers beyond conception. And in all these things, there are strange and wonderful principles of truth and honor. And science should be the first to see these things. Who should be the first to recognize the greatness of the universe unless it's the astronomer? He should know it. He sees it. He beholds mysteries he can never explain. And he quietly decides not to try to explain, but consider that his reputation is made if he can discover a new comet. All of this has no bearing upon the realities of things. And we are now looking for something to take with us into the future. We are worried about our own young people who have been deprived of most of the incentives for character building by the very commodities and conveniences created by science. We look with anxiety upon the collapse of our morals and our integrities and the constant increase of crime. Why should it be that a world that has produced great scientific institutions and it presents the highest form of education known anywhere on this earth in public systems, should also be the most crime-obsessed, narcotics-obsessed, money-obsessed, and accident-prone of all time. Why are these things not corrected? Science has a job here on earth that will take a thousand years, so it's going to try to get something else out into space. What we need is to get the space out of between the ears of these people and get them down to the serious problem of surviving and being part of a universal system that can survive. We don't know what to do with the rubbish. We don't know how much more basic resources we have, but we go blissfully on our way, not believing in God, but acting as though we believe that God would provide. The, uh, there seems to be a strange inconsistency here. We're leaving everything to hope and faith, and yet we deny both of them. And we deny the reality of the laws and principles which would help us to straighten out our lives. Therefore, it would seem very desirable that every public school system should have a basic statement of ethics. It would be possible to prepare a book sufficiently wide, sufficiently deep, sufficiently simple in its terminology to be useful to nearly anyone above the fourth grade. This should be required reading, 
and the most important examination in the course should be the examination on that book. They may flunk reading, they may flunk writing, and they may flunk arithmetic, but they'd better not flunk ethics. It's perfectly possible to be ignorant and safe and learn it and unsafe. And these things are becoming so vital to us that it's time to do something about it. So we could say that without going into theology, which is a difficult subject, we can point out definitely that there are laws arising we know not where, but complete and inevitable, which can never be broken by wealth or poverty. The success and failure of our material careers means very little because we are all going to lie down to a common sleep. There is nothing that we are gaining through science that is anything that means anything unless there is an immortality of the human soul which science doubts. Therefore, we are doing all this to lay down what years we have on the altar of the great deity of learning. And when we pass on, we will not know why we were here, where we came from, or where we're going. We like to presume that we're not going anywhere from a scientific standpoint, or that we are going to be perpetuated through our children. Well, I'll tell you, this type of salvation isn't as attractive as it used to be. Not everybody would like to be represented in future ages by their own descendants the way the descendants are acting at the moment. <laughs> so we need to get back to the doing-it-ourselves job. There should be a compulsory uh, setup, and science should do it. Because if science says so, it will be done. Even uh, the most adamant school teachers and the superintendents will do what science says. They will not do what the mothers and fathers say. They may not do what the churches say, but they will do what science say, says because this is the ultimate form of knowledge. And the ultimate form of knowledge is on the, at the moment very guilty of ignorance. And that's, this has to be corrected. It should be part of the education of every child, the requirements of citizenship in any nation, that the individual be able to define the values and integrities which motivate his life. He should be able to explain why he knows that he should do what is right, why he knows that he should not be out on the street peddling marijuana. All these things come, strangely enough, in a generation of skills. In the last hundred years, we have had more progress in sciences than ever before known. And yet in the same century, we have the worst corruption the world has ever faced. The least we can say is that the opportunity of knowledge has contributed to corruption. Therefore, the situation has to be changed. We have to come to a different point of view on what is necessary to be taught. I think for some time, I, when I was in Japan, I noticed that they had done something about it. But now, with all the com competition and trade and so forth, business is probably going to cause this to fade away. And everything will fade away if profit remains the final goal of existence. But why should it? Why should we so be so hypnotized by a dollar? After all, there are no pockets in our shrouds. We're not taking one dollar away with us. Why should we be willing to murder, rape, and carnage to get it? We have simply remained ignorant. Now, science could answer that question. It could give us a good reason to prove that we should not break the rules of life. Basic, simple language. This does not interfere with progress in all the fields of advanced, advanced learning, but it means that the grand scope of science is to include all that is necessary for the good of man. It is not enough that science will invent things. It is not enough that science would put an extra curl in the, in the paper clip. It is more and more valuable, more reasonable, more necessary that science helps to make each human being better as a person, more responsible, more efficient, and more kindly and understanding. Any form of knowledge that is purely intellectual and eliminates the equation of human relationships 
Any form of knowledge that does not have affection and love of truth, as well as skill in searching. All knowledge that is not dominated by values, by integrities, by emotional commitments, this type of, any such type of knowledge will not solve the problem of the 21st century. We're going to have to do better. And if we uh, watch it, the symptoms, it is observable that we are doing better. All around the world there are revulsions and rebellions against materialism. Materialism was the great sin of the intellectual. The intellectual tried to prove he was emancipated by convincing people he believed in nothing. This type of superiority is fading out in nations. Country after country is giving it up. Individual after individual is changing his polarities. And throughout the world there are groups rising up for the purpose of restoring the basic values of human relationships. This is all to the good. But it is also good that the new 20th century should have a proper introduction. It should be presented to us skillfully, wisely, lovingly, and factually. And it might be a wonderful thing if the scientific community would introduce us into a century in which principles and integrities will dominate all other considerations. And science will prove that the beginning of science is honesty. And without honesty, science is valueless. It is no longer necessary to assume that some people can understand and other people cannot understand. Science can talk down to anybody. It can t t tell the simplest person the facts of life. It also can reach up to the most attenuated atmospheres and explain problems beyond the comprehension of the laity. But in either case, whether it's the top or the bottom, the entire instruction should end in the one concept, basic and inevitable, that honor is the basis of survival, integrity is the basis of the continuance of patterns, and all of the logic in the world points to one thing, that which is not lo honest is not logical. It is not true if it is not for the good of all. And the concept of trying to build up private virtues and to permit public vices to continue will never solve our problems. So I think we should think very much about this matter, and we should think about it in the education of our children. If the educational facilities are not available, then we will find out why we are not able to educate our own children. And one of the reasons we won't be able to educate them is because science has given us the television. Everything it does, it does in a way that cripples something. Because in every case, the scientist, trustworthy or not, takes the attitude that the public will use what he discovers constructively. If he hasn't learned yet that this is not true, he's going to be a long time in learning. Actually, he cannot depend upon the integrity of anyone except himself. And if each of the scientists and each of the laymen have this integrity, our new century will be a great success. Right at the beginning of it, a textbook could be written, a very valuable and important textbook. A textbook summing up the mistakes of the past and setting out how they can be corrected. We've had wars from the beginning, but the worst ones in the present century. We've had uh, despots, madmen, fools, anarchists in every century, but the biggest ones have been in our present century. We have had all kinds of crime waves. We have had religious intolerance. We have had atheism. We have had all types of education. We have had martyrs. We have had all types of sufferers trying to help us to live better lives. All these together could make one tremendous statement of what we are here for and why and how we are going to stay here if we keep the rules and very likely leave if we don't keep the rules. Here we are worrying about whether or not there are invasions from Mars or out of space, and we're not sure at all how long the atmosphere on our planet will be suitable to breathe. Nothing is being done to correct the problems. The, uh, they are talked about. We have money set aside to take care of rubbish heaps. We have all these things. But the great minds are not working with that. The great minds are working on how to 
possibly conquer the solar system, which is not very likely, but at the same time it could be dramatized by some motion picture company. <laughs> Actually, the whole attention is away from the reality of the trouble. We do not face the problem. We look away from it, and when someone has a pleasant experience, we dramatize that and assume that all is going to go well. We do not face the problems, and without facing them, we will just simply carry them into the next century as part of a burden which we really don't want. We don't need it, and we shouldn't have it. Now when we get down to science on some of the other situations in which they, they play, it all plays a part, and which we should know something of, we have to realize that science is also based upon mathematics. Actually, mathematics was the first of the divine sciences. And the sciences of Pythagoras and the ancients were three. Mathematics, astronomy, and music. Now, well, one thing we are having trouble with is music. What are we going to carry forward into the future? Are we going to carry Beethoven and Bach? Or are we going to carry uh, hard rock? Mm. Now, here is the interesting thing. How has it happened that some scientific groups haven't indicated clearly the difficulties resulting from the perversion of music? We have little articles occasionally appearing warning against it, or some brief mention on the television. But why doesn't science break this thing down scientifically and medically and give us the solid facts and stand behind them. The same is true in all these different fields of uh, art. Why do we not get the solid facts? Why does science not include most of the wisdom that has come to us from the past? Now in architecture we have the same problem. Architecture was one of the great arts of antiquity. Architecture is not merely putting up buildings to put business houses into. Architecture is a sacred science. It is a science of making the world suitable for people to live in. Every building that is asymmetrically involved, is incorrect, is poorly built, worse designed, is a disgrace to society and also a danger. Pythagoras in, in, in Greece walked the streets of Athens, uh, supposedly. I doubt if he was ever there, but one of his philosophers were. Then uh, he, this philosopher came to a building. He struck the key keynote of that building on his lute. He said, if I strike this building's lute, this keynote loud enough, it will crumble the building. And on another occasion, he was a uh, Pythagorean was present when a young man who was in very angry over the, the crime which he was he which had been committed against his father dashed, in, dashed into a banquet with a drawn dagger to kill the uh, man who was responsible for disgracing his father as he reached up for the dagger to drive it into the man at the banquet table a Pythagorean who was there struck a note on the lute the young man was paralyzed he couldn't move, and he was led away without having committed this crime for which he had the intention. All these things are science. What are we doing with them? Nothing. Maybe someone comes along, writes a little book on this philosophy of music. Science pays no attention. All they are working with, apparently, is one little facet. But we are people living in a world. We have many sides to our natures. We have parents and children. We have friends and guardians. We have all kinds of relationships with people. These are not considered. They're not identified at all. The only thing is pure science. Well, pure science is in a sense sterile. It does not have any value to us unless it helps us to do something or to be something. There is no science that can wait, waste its time out among the stars forever. It has got to get down and do the things that are necessary now. Our world has so many things the matter with it that all the scientists put together could work on the job for the next hundred years. It has every kind of a problem. 
more coming up every day. And yet, up to now, the whole policy has been to keep on creating the problem and hoping that it will go away. Well, for a scientist to hope the truth will go away is very unscientific. He is not talking straight. He is making remarks that are not worthy of him. He must know directly that if he wants the trouble to go away, he's got to make it go away. And he has no intentions of doing that. That would interfere with his comforts and his pleasures. Now, young people starting out under this particular glamour have very little inducement to do anything. A few of them may go into athletics, a few will win in the Olympic Games, but for the most part they will drift through into some mediocre job and hope for the best. They are not given any value to work for. They are not taught why they are builders of a human family. They are not, though, do not to know why that each generation is a foundation stone upon which an infinite future is being built. No one pays any attention to these things. And if one, one quiet little person gets up and says something, they are laughed down by the sophisticated intellectuals. There is no place. And I noticed the, I was working on a little research problem here that has a little side on this, probably not you know, very well known. Uh, the great uh, uh, national uh, uh, poem uh, of uh, the Nordic people in Finland is the Kalevala, a poem that tells the whole story, like Homer's, Homer's Odyssey and Iliad, of the history of the people in myth and legend. Now, there are two versions of this exist in English. They are not divided in very much from each other in time, both are 19th or 18th century, but the translation of the poem, which consists, by the way, of 27,000 verses, uh, is different in each. In one, for instance, there is a definite statement of what we might term of something mystical, something that could well have been part of a people who, like uh, the early American Indian, had a great oral tradition, but no written language. So in this one version, it says that the hero goes forth to seek the lost word. Now, the lost word is an interesting term to appear in a national epic, but it is a familiar term to a great many people. And, uh, and another line where it refers to the word of the master is interesting also because it indicates that these people had certain esoteric beliefs. The other translation changes both of those so, so statements so that they are meaningless. The probabilities are that the first person, the original one, was a little bit enlightened. The second one wanted to make sure that such ridiculous enlightenment was not perpetuated. So he took it out. Now, if it was in, it should stay in. If idealism is part of our racial tradition, it should be kept. And if we look back and find that most of the people who ever did anything in this world that was really a permanent value were idealists, I think the time has come for science to become basically a sponsor of idealism, to prove beyond question that right principles will win and, and that wrong principles and wrong uses will never end in anything but trouble. Science can sell that, and it has every reason to sell it, because science itself can see it. But it is very carefully overlooking some of these things, or simply has been trained out of seeing them. The public school child is being trained out of idealism, and then we wonder why he gets into some racket and uh, gets in jail the first few months after he graduates from school. We do not do anything to prevent him losing character, but we will punish him if he does. This doesn't make sense. In the same way with science. The science doesn't actually say you sh shouldn't be an idealist, but it actually penalizes you instantly if you are. If you go out to find employment and it is known that you're an idealist, a great many doors will be closed to you. This should not be true. We should recognize integrities and honor them. And we find in all of these different walks of life, everything has been changed to reduce 
the an idealistic factor. And I've read a great many translations of modern books out of older sources. And in every case, the idealism is played down. And if the idealism isn't played down, you will have to get the original edition, which is very scarce. So we have everywhere a constant intentional adulteration of values. If we do this in the next century, we're going to be in big trouble. We need more than anything else to take into that new century a conviction, a, a determination, a dedication to make it a better century than this one. And it shouldn't be too hard to beat this one because for the little happiness we've had, we've paid with a great deal of pain. We have come very near to ravaging the earth. We have destroyed things we can never replace. All these things should become a cause of a little conscience. We should say to ourselves, well, let's not do it again. Let's try to do it right this time. Let's start in by believing that good is the most important thing in the world and is the synonym of a divine power at the source of life. Let us admit that we may not understand that power, but that it has to be there. And as a proof of it, as the Kabbalists pointed out, the proof of the nature of deity is, is given to us in the rules of nature, the laws of nature. Nature is not lawless. Natural law is real. And natural law is a manifestation of something. So as the idealist says, it is a manifestation of divine law. Someone else says it's a manifestation of universal law. But whatever it is, it is a manifestation and as a manifestation, it proves that the wrong will never win. That there is no possibility of breaking the rules without suffering. Now, we are suffering enough and probably will suffer a little more before the generation is over. And because of that, we should be very well intentioned at this time. I think there is enough encouragement coming up around us to give us a little strength to do better ourselves. There are more people trying to find out there is greater determination to live better. There is more dedication to principles. And these things are good. But we should look forward with great hope to seeing these changes moving into the scientific and educational world. That we find these kind of rules in the hospitals and in the universities and in the clinics and in all the research laboratories. That in every case there should be greater emphasis upon integrity that we should not adulterate our goods, we should not overcharge for our services, and we should not deny the rights of people to have their dreams and hopes without penalizing them. There is no doubt in the world that uh, we are going to go into the 21st century as graduates from a school of hard knocks that will be difficult to duplicate. We've gone through the great problems of war, we've gone through catastrophes, we had thousands and millions of people to cast out of their countries. We've had to do everything you can think of in the worst upset the world has ever known. And at the same time as this upset, we are continuing to develop abstract scientific theories. Theories that might possibly, in times of leisure, be an enjoyable pursuit, an entertainment value. But at this time, we can't afford some of them. What we need now is to something to get governments and people and individuals and families back together. We are told now that the average marital relationship is getting to the point where eight out of every ten marriages will result in a divorce. Well, we can't really say that's particularly good. And we can't say that these very learned people in all their fields have made any valid contributions to this fact. We have some psychologists struggling with it. We have some domestic therapists working on it. But what we need is a broad statement from the top, uh, from that which cannot be denied and is generally accepted, that these things are not as they should be, and that they must be corrected, and that the very simple methods of correcting them will be enforced. And the, the correction of all these things less, rests upon one thing, Honesty. Honesty will cor correct 90% of the problems that confront us. 
And if we can't get that honesty ourselves, then it should be given to us by scientific dictum. We should have laws passed, we should have whatever rule is necessary, not to interfere with our privileges or problems of doing right, but putting a restraint upon our conscious abuse of power, conscious abuse of wealth, and conscious exploitation of each other. This would be a nice job for the scientific community, and I don't see any reason why it couldn't be done. But it would take a group of people who, are not, who would take some of the billions that we have been expending trying to estimate the distance between here and some other planet, and will use this money to set up the necessary structure for education in the 21st century. A re general reformation of the public school theory, putting it back to where it started from, putting it back to Comedius, the man who gave it to us in the first place, or doing something to help us to find ways of uh, working with the young, such as the Montessori method and many others. The time has come to do some of these things and for the so-called learned powers to do them. We have laboratories all over the country. We have schools and universities full of courses. Let these things be united, for a time at least, on getting us into the next century in one piece. That out of all of this we shall actually be able to move into a clean air that we will not have to fail, fight and face all these difficulties. Air pollution, water pollution, soil pollution. And these, the great abstract forces, go blissfully on their way, paying no attention to anything. When they finally get it forced, they have some cover that they hide under. And worst of all, most of the individuals involved are not themselves honest. And as a result of that, their own uh, pleas have ulterior motives. We've got to have some honesty, we've got to have some ethics, we've got to have some reason, common sense and a little idealism to get us into the next century. It's just about time to work on that. And we can get ourselves ready for that transition by ending our animosities, cleaning out the past in ourselves, and stepping across into a new century as new people. And then over the century will be conceived in liberty, but the individual will be reconceived in integrity. If we conceive these things and do them, we can start the new age with a great deal of help because the information is available. The technical means of communicating it are available. It is generally known to some, but not to enough. And the power of opinion is rested in those who do not understand and do not want to understand. So there is only one grave problem, and that is that we have the right to make these corrections. And we would like to have the learned groups, such as schools, universities, hospitals, clinics, all that type, uh, be in the vanguard to give popular confidence to the fact that all mistakes have been corrected, all misjudgments have been mended, and that we are going to go forward on the basis of the fatherhood of one divine parent and the brotherhood of all humanity. Now, if we go to work on that basis, we're going to get somewhere. And we can also do it without offending anyone. We do not need to offend any person of reasonable mind. And any individual who is offended at honesty deserves to be. And we'll have to le gradually learn that he is not privileged to get away with it. He can be dishonest if he wants to, but he must take the consequences. The consequences of individual dishonesty are corruption. Of collective dishonesty are the collapse of nations. All these things we have to bear in mind. If we bear those things in mind and think straight about them, I think we can use science and not allow it to abuse itself. We can make it a greater instrument of good without destroying it, but having it work with us to transmute and transform. The alchemists are said to have been able to change base metals into gold. Scientists can do it also, but not on a practical economic basis. But these things can be happening. Science, as alchemy, can transmute society if it wants to. But it can only do this if it recognizes its sacred duty to dedicate all knowledge and all learning to all who need. Until this is accomplished, we will never have peace or happiness in this world.
Well, that's it.